for sure. Yep. <clears throat> Chill out, girl. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it's actually not the standing here that makes me nervous. It's the trying to tell you my story that freaks me out. <laughs> and um, just a little heads up that during my practice runs, and I'm not going to tell you how many times I practiced, I um, often got a little choked up. <clears throat> so God knows I don't want to do that standing here today, but don't be surprised if I do. So, <clears throat> sometimes a muse can be like a cute guy that you're just totally crazy over, who unknowingly inspires you to write a whole lot of love poems, even though you've never written a single love poem in your life. I had that guy <laughs> once, and it was brief, but I wrote like I'd never written before. Lots and lots of poetic prose. And it was like, it was just super fun to be swept up in that muse and to watch words just pour onto the paper. And I was an aspiring writer at that time, so um, I mean, it just felt really good to be in that place. So that's just one kind of muse. Today, I'm actually here to talk about a different kind of muse. But first, I just want to share this quote um, for you to ponder as I go through the rest of my talk. There are no foreign lands. It is the traveler who is foreign. So back to Muse. Let's say we think of Muse in its broadest terms as inspiration. That means that a Muse can be anything. Anything that inspires not only our creative endeavors, but I would argue in creating ourselves by shaping, inspiring, and influencing our values, our spirituality, and even our worldview. So for me, travel has been my biggest muse. It's the thing that changed me and inspired my entire life path. So here's the backstory. Imagine that you are American born to Filipino immigrants and you're living the dream, the American dream. You got the big house with the big yard. Your family cruises around in a Ford Esquire station wagon with the fake wood paneling. <laughs> I'm totally dating myself. You're a Girl Scout. You eat Campbell's tomato soup for lunch. You're watching the Brady Bunch every day just before dinner, and then the love boat right after dinner. <laughs> and every Sunday, you go to church, and afterwards, the family goes to McDonald's, where all five of us can eat for a whole of $10. A long time ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can't even eat there for $10. <laughs> and then one day, Dad comes home and says, We're moving to Saudi Arabia! And suddenly, it's bye-bye Big Mac. <laughs> And hello, shawarma. <laughs> Which is a really great trade-off. <laughs> so in one plane ride, our life turned from living in suburbia in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, to living in a fishing village on the Persian Gulf, to having a six-bedroom home, to living in a double-wide trailer to having friends from Cherry Hill, to having friends from around the world, to being the only Filipinos in your community, to being five Filipinos of dozens and dozens of Filipinos, 
And then instead of M&Ms, we ate Smarties. Instead of Coke, we drank Pepsi. Don't say it. Instead of, <laughs> instead of orange juice, there was white grape juice. And happily replacing Wonder Bread is Arabic bread. And then at every party, you're suddenly drinking Saudi champagne. <laughs> Hence begins travel as my muse. <clears throat> So it was 1977 when we moved to the Middle East, where we spent three years. And then after that, we went to South America, to Venezuela, for two years. And then my parents moved back to Saudi with my sister, and I went to Europe to an all-girls Catholic boarding school. And my brother went back to the States for college. So I was 10 years old when we moved to Saudi. And then I came back to the States for college also. And it was during this overseas life um, that we had this really awesome employee perk, which was to travel internationally twice a year. One was a two-week rest and recuperation trip to like a nearby country. And then annually, we did like an around-the-world trip, which for my family always included three stops at least. One was to the Philippines to see our relatives. One was to California, where my father's company was based. And then we always came back to Boston to maintain some roots, or feel like we had some roots. Um, but sprinkled in between those three stops are always many other stops. During which we went to see monuments, temples, churches, museums, historic places like up the yin yang. <laughs> <laughs> which when you're a kid could get really, <laughs> really annoying. <laughs> so this is a picture of us in Indonesia, um, right after my dad had a few words with us, because <laughs> we were really grumpy and we were begging him to give us a day off from sightseeing, but it didn't work. <laughs> anyway, what I mostly remember from our trips um, is how regular people lived, especially in developing countries which really came from our annual visits to the Philippines where we have over 600 living relatives and that's just on my dad's side of the family. My parents both were born and raised in the Philippines with not a lot of money and during World War II. And my dad actually grew up some of his years living in a bamboo hut and a few times during the war had to move on a moment's notice to escape bombs. This is a picture of my dad and his parents and the, the rest of, uh, the first of the rest of his other five siblings, his sister Pat. And as you might guess from the picture, my grandfather fought in the war and he even walked and survived the Bataan death march. So my brother was born in Lebanon, and I was born in Boston, and my sister was born in Puerto Rico. So our annual trips to the Philippines gave us the chance to learn about our roots, our Filipino traditions, how our relatives lived, how they got around, and how they shopped in the palenque, which means market. Um, all of these pictures are um, somewhat recent. Uh, I don't really have pictures from the late 70s. Um, but I can say that not a lot has changed since then, except it was a lot poorer in the 70s than it is now. So we visited and stayed with relatives and friends of all economic backgrounds, not only in the capital city, but in the province. And from our visits, I just remember like having to learn to take a bath with two buckets of water. One was tap water and one was hot water from the stove. There was never any drinking water from the faucet. And then I just noticed how every piece of tin foil and plaster crap was saved and reused. And that wasn't to protect the environment. <laughs> it's because they just simply didn't have money to buy another box. <coughs> Sanitation was lacking in rural areas. And I'm going to spare you the gory details on that. Um, 
there were often brownouts and blackouts. But um, even today, many of these things that I just listed are still true in parts of the Philippines. My parents and my aunts and uncles also taught us to eat street food, which is actually a way of life for many people. Not like here where it's a foodie fad and something that you do when you're coming home at two in the morning from the bar. Thank you. <laughs> so I actually suffered a lot eating to my heart's content in the late 70s. I got really super sick in Thailand, Egypt, and Kenya. But it's actually paid off because like this, this is a stomach of steel. <laughs> And I never get sick anymore when I travel. <laughs> so I was super curious about our experiences in the Philippines and also similar experiences in Indonesia where we visited other relatives. That I got a graduate degree in international development, which is the study of poverty alleviation in developing countries. And through those studies, I ended up working in Costa Rica for four months, Indonesia for six months, India for four months, and then the Philippines for three months. And I continued to connect to people living in the rural communities and villages, people who made just a few dollars a week, like many of my extended relatives, visiting them in their homes, experiencing their village lives, and trying to find a path out of rural poverty. These experiences like made every country so much more memorable to me. And perhaps more importantly, they made every country feel familiar, like they were no longer a foreign country to me. They became a place I knew a bit beyond the surface. And all of those memories have stayed with me in so much as it changed how I travel today and how I see the world. So these days, I will travel alone when I can, and I don't really plan very much. I never take organized tours. I mostly stay in smaller places where interaction with staff is more personal. And on my first day, I try to make it a point to learn how to say good morning and thank you in the local language. And then I walk, and 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 I try to disappear into the landscape, which is somewhat easy to do because of my skin color. Um, I wander around musing about life in this place. And I do go see all the historic places, um, but what I like most to do is to walk in the path of everyday people, where they eat, where they shop, where they spend time, just like I did many times as a kid traveling with my parents. And then I try to interact with people even if it's super brief. I'm basically, I'm seeking the mundane because I want to humanize my experience rather than to pass through with a checklist of sights to see. So this is a timeline of most of my travels from birth to present day. And I kind of like putting this together because it gave me comfort to know that I've stayed connected to my country of origin my whole life. Um, and so now I just want to share some of my stories and hopefully give you a flavor for what I'm trying to express. So in 1998, I worked in New Delhi, New, New Delhi, India, and on one long weekend, I went to Udaipur, which is south of New Delhi in the state of Rajasthan. Um, and the funny thing about Udaipur, which I didn't know until I got there, for all you James Bond fans, it's the place where the movie Octopussy was filmed. <laughs> so you might recognize that palace because it's in many scenes in that movie. Um, and the town was super proud of this movie because literally every restaurant and tea house had a copy playing on their TV every, <laughs> like every night of the week. <laughs> so anyway, this is like the experience that I feel like really set me on my 
path for how I travel today. And it went like this. I just wandered around Udaipur every day and wherever I was for lunch is where, like, where I just eat lunch wherever I happened to be at that point of the day. But somehow I ended up going back to the same restaurant every single night for dinner. Um, and then I just hang out there several hours after with my journal. And um, it was a small 10 table place and it was pretty near where I was staying. And it's where I saw Octopussy for the first time in my life. <laughs> um, and the very first night there, the owner of the restaurant, which is the guy in the, fellow, uh, in the picture over there, um, he just was very kind to me and he always checked up on me and made sure I was happy and that my stomach was full. And uh, so his kindness and the good food kind of brought me back there every single night. And um, he just always greeted me like I was a regular. And he'd often bring his little boy over to my table to say hello. <clears throat> so over the course of four nights, like a little friendship was born. And on my last day, he invited me up into his residence above the restaurant so he could introduce me to his wife. And then we took that picture as a goodbye. And um, I just remember feeling really sad at that point because it was kind of a first experience like as a solo traveler. And it was so nice to be in this rural community in this gigantic country where I didn't really know anybody and to be treated so kindly by this family. Obviously, I've never forgotten it, and I try to repeat that experience whenever I can. Um, and just reflecting on this little trip, I realized that going back to the same place every night turned this rural town into a familiar place, which was a great way to end every day of adventuring into the unfamiliar, especially when you're a solo traveler. It also gave me a feeling of safety like I was no longer nameless to the community and that somebody might look out for me because they got to know me sitting in their restaurant every night. So now I'm going to jump to 2017 when I went to Turkey. And in this picture I'm in Prince's Island which is just off the coast of Istanbul. And I'm just going to read you a little story that I posted in my Instagram about that day. <coughs> While at Prince's Island, I saw these guys playing backgammon. They waved when they saw me peering. I snapped a pick and moved closer. One pulled a seat over, inviting me to hang. So I plopped right down, right next to the gray jacketed guy. He says, in Turkey, hello is merhaba. Merhaba. Merhaba, I said back, like a proud kid having just learned something new. Eyes returned to the board. I hadn't played backgammon in a really long time, so I watched to figure it out, unable to ask questions except through hand signals. Two, one, said the vested guy, pointing to himself first, while the other guy ran over to the counter, came back and said, chai? <laughs> yes, chai. I nodded enthusiastically. They continued to play. Where you from? asked he to my left. America. He grunts. <laughs> Trump. <laughs> <laughs> then he makes a face crinkling his nose. I chuckle and return a crinkled face sharing his sentiment. <laughs> he laughs and looks back at the board. Four, two, the vested fella says proudly. The other fella affectionately growls and taunts him back. Lie, 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 he says, <laughs> which I glean to mean, beat that move, said with an evil laugh. I sipped my scrumptious tea, laughing lightly, enjoying these two gents. What you name? Karina, I say, rolling the R. Me, Uday, like Saddam Hussein. My name is Uday, like Saddam's son. Ah, okay. I tried to ask if they work, if on lunch break. He somehow understood, pulled out his phone, found a picture, and showed me wrought iron fencing, and then showed me his rough hands. 
back to the board. Dice roll, chips move. I'm still trying to figure out what the heck is going on. <laughs> then hands go up, signaling triumph. The vested guy wins. <laughs> Uday concedes, closes the board, and looks at me with the, oh well, it was fun look. <laughs> I had finished my tea. They both gulped down their last sip. Picture, I signaled with my phone. They nod happily. I moved closer to frame the selfie. They both look up. They're waving. <laughs> How freaking cute! <laughs> Snap. We stand, shake hands. I say teşekkür, thank you in Turkish. We part and I continue meandering, my heart warmed once again by the people of Turkey. Back in Istanbul, I stayed in a small hotel, and it was low season, so there weren't a lot of people around anyway. And I got to know the guy at the front desk, and his name is Ulash. So every morning, I came down the stairs, and I'd say, good morning, Ulash. In my first couple days there, he was just elated that I was saying his name. And so he'd say, I love that you're saying my name. Say it again. <laughs> So I would oblige and say, good morning, Ulash. And he'd smile from ear to ear, and I'd scoot into the breakfast room, and I'd chow down, and I'd come back, sit at his desk, share tea, and talk about the day. So I was there for seven days, and of course, on my last day, we took the obligatory selfie and became Facebook friends. And then he invited me to come back anytime and even stay with his family. So now we're going to Egypt, but not to Cairo. We're going to Rashid, which is a small town on a river. I wasn't traveling alone here. I was traveling with my best friend from grad school, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed guy from Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> so we were looking for historic buildings in Rashid, but we never found them. Instead, we somehow ended up in the local market, which is like gold if you want to have a local experience. And we, do what, we did what we always do, which was we walked around, we got curious, we got up close, we made eye contact, we smiled. And here's an excerpt of what I wrote that night in my Instagram. We were clearly an uncommon sight to the locals, but as we walked through the narrow alleys of this market, People waved, and they smiled, and they offered us food to taste. Banana, date, falafel, meat, beans, and palm. We were invited into a kitchen where one fella explained and showed everything to us, but in Arabic. <laughs> and then he and his pals asked us to take their picture. Never ever did they try to sell us anything. They just wanted to say hello teach us about their produce, and shake our hands. I just kept saying, Rashid Jamila, Rashid Jamila. Rashid is beautiful, and all was well. We were there for about 90 minutes before we had to head back to the city, and I really hated leaving that day because I just didn't want the experience to end. Um, and as you can see, they love having their picture taken in Egypt. <laughs> So I wanted to quote Brene Brown right now because thinking about that experience, this quote seemed to say it all. Never underestimate the power of being seen. So I also wrote this in my Instagram about my day in Rashid. Smile and they will smile back. Wave and they will wave back. Laugh and they will laugh back. Offer your hand, and they will offer theirs back. So now we're going to Afghanistan, which is in 2011. And I was invited to go by an American friend that was doing business there. And I went, this is obviously during the war, because I wanted to humanize this country, a place we had been in war with 
eight years at that time in a place that was scary to most. So not much actually surprised me about Afghanistan given all of my travels, but the only difference was the possibility of being bombed and ambushed and killed. Um, so my friend had an Afghan business partner, so he was very connected to the locals. So I did get to interact quite a bit with Afghans. Um, and in this picture, I went to a place called Skatistan, which was started by an Australian guy who introduced skateboarding to street kids. And um, so he decided to open an indoor skate park, which was built by my friend, and to take the kids off the street, keep them safe, and then offered them education. So I just spent a few hours with these girls while they had lunch, and then I took all of their pictures, and they showed me their book bags and their books and their notebooks, and it was just so, so cool. And, uh, you know, who's not going to fall in love with those faces? This is a Friday afternoon traditional Afghan meal. Their Friday is our Sunday. Um, I was like the only woman among eight Afghan men that didn't speak English, but uh, that's my American friend up there in the top right. Another thing that was really um, interesting about my experience in Kabul was being, I'm pretty sure I was the only liberal in a camp of 200 staunch conservative men and women um, with a very strong gun culture because these 200 people were ex-law enforcement and military veterans. And I had an awesome time with these guys. I pretty much, I just laughed hysterically for three weeks. And I let some of them take me to the shooting range where I held and shot guns for the first time in my life. Uh, just, it's just wild to shoot an AK-47 in Afghanistan. I don't know, it's just weird. <laughs> um, I didn't get a thrill out of it like some people do. Um, but this is the experience of being with this crowd. I guess living in a pretty liberal community is it just reminded me that we're all people. People trying to survive something as edgy as being in Afghanistan during the war. And since then, I've been conscious about trying to see everybody as a human being first and foremost and really only and to drop their political labels. But let it be known that I am not perfect at that. <laughs> <laughs> so that same friend sent me to Mongolia six months later. And I spent Christmas and New Year's there, and it was probably one of the most memorable New Year's Eves I've ever had. Um, yeah. <laughs> we went to the market, and we were actually shopping for towels because we were setting up an apartment. Um, but we got distracted. We never got the towels because <laughs> pretty soon we saw everybody drinking vodka and champagne at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on that New Year's Eve. So we stepped into their stalls and we got curious and into the holiday spirit. And uh, with an easy smile and a hello, the locals were immediately pouring us drinks and sharing their food and merriment with us. So nobody, like, nobody spoke English. And it was 25 below zero. Um, but we had the best freaking time. <laughs> <laughs> we went to like maybe three or four stalls that day, and of course, we were drunk <laughs> by 6 p.m. <laughs> So hopefully by now you can see a pattern in my travel experiences. But I want to just take you to one more place. My muse of all muses. The middle of nowhere. Wake Island, which is not a foreign country. It's actually a US territory and an Air Force installation with tons of history. Um, and it just feels like its own little world. And this one just kind of knocked me off my feet, like just, just, I don't know what it did to me. Um, 
I went there for work in July of 2018 and I knew very little about the island before I got there except that there would be like 100 men and 11 women that live there <laughs> and it's 2.81 square miles big and 2 million rats. <laughs> <laughs> so my job was just basically to understand the life and the work of this construction crew and to like take their pictures. This is the view of Wake Island when you're flying in, which is just really amazing. And what was funny was once I got there, the rats were like nothing. They were like oversized field mice. And I, I forgot all about them because everything else about the landscape and the place and the people just kind of captured my heart. So you guys remember when I mentioned the cute guy at the beginning of the talk? Good. Because <laughs> I had 12. <laughs> Twelve cute guys on Wake Island as my muses, my hosts, my pals, my family for two weeks. And I just fell in love with all of them. <laughs> I fell in love with them because of their stories of being on Wake Island, where they came from, and how they found themselves working in the middle of nowhere. What makes them tick? and how meaningful it is to them to work on this historic World War II battlefield where 98 guys just like them, construction guys, died during the war in 1943. So for two weeks I watched them do their thing, their hard labor under the intense heat of Wake Island. We ate every meal together, we drank beer, and we hunted rats. <laughs> Which is really a bizarre experience. Um, and I just gained such huge respect for their trades and their technical knowledge and their hard work in the field. I mean, I just never spent that much time with crane operators, mechanics, and carpenters, and electricians, and these guys just blew me away. Wake Island is also rich with natural beauty. There are like literally thousands of these birds flying over you every single day. The marine life is incredible. You can see all of this with just your toes dipped in the water. <coughs> if you're a diver, you can dive in one of the most pristine coral reefs in the world. You can fish for bonefish, which I guess is a big deal if you're a fisher. But tarnishing that natural beauty, you can bear witness to the ills of plastic pollution on, one, on the shores of one of the most remote islands in the world. What else was striking about Wake or being on Wake Island is that there's no cell phone service on the island, there's no 24-7 Wi-Fi, <clears throat> there's no car, restaurant, or cafe. There's only one bar and one cafeteria and they're not open all the time. But just a few days in, I, I just fell in love with the life and I just loved how uncomplicated it was and it, it was like this physical change in my body um, of feeling unburdened of modern day stress. It's an experience that I've mused about like literally every day since I left July 21st of last summer. Wake Island is also like a creative muse for me. Um, I've written three articles about the work on Wake Island and the first one came out in January. The second one just came out and it's on the cover of this industry magazine which I love. And the third one's coming out in November. And this trip was so impactful that I just gave it a name. It's called My Wake Island Awakening. 
And to me, that sounds like a great title for a book. So <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> so to sum this up, on an NPR show earlier this month, journalist Peter Bailey said this when he was talking about the relationship of U.S. territories t in the Caribbean to the mainland. He said, let's just be honest. When you think of the Caribbean, you don't see people. You see a vacation. So this struck a chord with me given my talk today because for me, India is not just about the Taj Mahal and ashrams. Egypt is not just about the pyramids and cruises on the Nile River. Afghanistan is not just the Taliban, the war, and women wearing burqas. Though on the surface things look and seem different, the truth is this. They are all places with people, people with lives. They have families. <sighs> they work and they play. They eat, drink, and be merry. They laugh, cry, and love. And they too love to take selfies. <laughs> <laughs> so whether you speak the language or not, it's always possible to connect to others when you're traveling. It takes very little to see their humanity. And wouldn't you guys agree that the world could use a lot more humanity these days? 